We have some students who have experience in the field, but no uh, degree or certification or anything mm -hmm. behind it. And there was a student in this cycle who said, I've been doing this for a while now. Why do I have to take this class? I know what I'm doing. Like, why do I even have to get a degree? Why can't I just work in the community? I've been doing this. I sit on a number of boards. And last week she said, oh, that's what that's called. That's that's what um, conflict resolution is. That's what person-centered planning is. That's what that's called. That's what motivational interviewing is. Mm -hmm. um, and she didn't realize that she was doing part pieces of that. And now you have the theory, you have the technique, and now we're practicing in a class. So she's able to Welcome to another Resiliency Roundtable from the Northeast Resiliency Consortium. My name is Ed Fiennes. I am the Content and Faculty Engagement Specialist here for the LEAD team. And today we have CHW instructor Joelle Rivera and job developer Randall Ward from Capital Community College in the great city of Hartford, Connecticut, right downtown. You couldn't, it's actually in the shade of <laughs> a giant highway interchange between 91 and 84. So you can't miss it unless you're zooming by and then you'll miss it. Uh, it's, uh, uh, they have built these great little com mini communities out of the service work, sort of workforce development monies uh from a tax grant that the, i i find it almost i find it frustrating <laughs> that i can't t tell every story um so this is a this is another attempt to sort of plug everybody into what's really happening down in the classrooms you know between instructors and students between students and one another and between students and job developers where all the action is and where all the amazing change happens so uh, I'm going to get out of the way and let them talk to you. This is a, uh, we're going to focus on community health worker, the community health worker program in particular, the one that Joel teaches, but Randall will certainly be speaking to, you know, what he will be speaking to as a job developer is certainly, you know, a figures a lot broader in any sort of relationship between uh, a job developer and uh, a program like um, that, that, trained service workers. So uh, without further ado, this is Joelle and Randall and myself on Resiliency Roundtables. Probably. We start all of these in the same, same place. I'm going to ask both of you uh, name, job title, and um, what makes, uh, what is the resilient, what is a resilient version of you do? What is the resilient, you know, what is that, what is that person, what is, not just doing your job, but for you personally, what is resilience okay. at your job? I'm Randall Ward, I'm the job developer, and um, to your question, the resilient part of what I do consistently is intense research. Um, I'm consistently looking at job trends, where jobs are, um, definitely consistently procuring new sites for our students mm -hmm. um, to gain the best act, um, the, main, the best opportunity that they can access um, so that they can potentially be hired in or make themselves more marketable in the field of employment. So. The resilient part of me is just consistently researching, trying to find that path to get our students into the best opportunity possible. Is there a quick follow up? Uh, is there a the the there to and there's kind of a spectrum, I imagine, for a job developer where I'm sure there's pressure for how much am I going to do for them and how much am I going to cross my arms and demand that they go out and do it themselves. What, where are you on that sort of one to 10 in terms of how you feel like, how much am I going to do and how much am I going to sort of have them do? Well, I challenge our students um, to really do a lot on their own, which is a part of our grant, that, that resiliency. Mm -hmm. Because if the students can't see that I'm resilient, then they won't be resilient. 
So I'm constantly monitoring who's doing what. So when I'm sending out emails, follow-ups, I place phone calls and what as well and inquire, have you done this? Have you attended this job fair? What was the last three jobs you applied for, et cetera? So I'm consistently monitoring and challenging our students. So um, I would like to see our students do more in that area, mm -hmm. just increase that level of intensity. Um, so that's where, you know, I started to develop some workshops mm -hmm. um, to have students come in and explain to me where their challenges are. Why are they not being successful if they're not being successful? Mm -hmm. So uh, I do try to embed more resiliency in our students to be more self-sufficient as opposed to um, just getting opportunities based off of what we offer, mm -hmm. okay? Because none of us are guaranteed to consistently help them forever. So they have to develop that resiliency right. um, to be self-sustainable and um, um, sufficient. Yeah, so we'll, we'll definitely come back to specifics on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, my name is Joel Rivera and I'm an instructor here um, for the community health worker class. And I think that for me, um, resiliency is in my genes, it's in my blood. Um, you know, I come from the same place that these students come from, from Hartford, the projects, mm -hmm. um, single mom, on welfare. Um, and so most of these students, when they do their story, my perspective, my culture, this is where they come from. They come mm -hmm. from humble beginnings um, and they all have a story. Um, and so this is something that I, I live and I breathe and I still live and breathe every single day. Mm -hmm. um, having to pay off these crazy loans, <laughs> um, you know, and just um, working full time and then also coming here. I think that's, yeah, I, I am them and they are me. So Yeah, it's, and I'll ask you the same thing I was asking Randall. Like the, the, as a teach, as an instructor, as an educator, where do you find, you know, is there a, a point on the spectrum? for a was you know when to lay off and then when do you carry that sort of what do you what do you kind of well i'm thoughts? really ch i challenge my students because i feel like you know we have the same beginnings and so i was able to find my own way through through this and i've gone off to college i have two advanced degrees i have licenses certifications and mm -hmm. so you know we have the same makeup you can do it just like me so i'm always challenging them um so you're my so you're almost more modeling then even yeah, it's I'm, almost like a passive act like just by you being in the room yes. knowing where you're coming from how much your personal story do you do you feel like you, you share? i i there's this one exercise that's not in the curriculum it's mm -hmm. um when we go over my culture my perspective and actually mm -hmm. randall sat in on this lab <laughs> this time and Joanne also said, and she's our coordinator. Right. Um, and so I tell them, I, I sit and I and I say, you know, let's talk about confidentiality, which is a part of the curriculum, and mm -hmm. you know how we want to be as confidential as possible, but you can't ever guarantee that in a group setting. Mm -hmm. So share what you feel most comfortable in sharing. And so I model the way of this is my story. I grew up at, you know, in Hartford, age seventeen. I was kicked out of the house for being, you know, for being gay. And I really just mm -hmm. give them my perspective my story all the way through undergrad and to getting to where I'm at today mm -hmm. and so the message is is if I can do all of that you guys can do the same thing too yeah. um, and so that allows them to be very free and when Randall and Joanne came they were very humble to see all of I mean their stories are so powerful mm -hmm. you have students who um, have a lot of anger issues, students who have been molested, students who have been victims of domestic violence, up alcoholism, mm -hmm. substance abuse, just all kinds of backgrounds. Um, and, you know, for me, it, I sit with them. They sit in that in that pain and, you know, and, and we kind of just work through it in class. And, but those are the environments they're going to be walking into yeah. with strangers. They're not even to have, like, again, the, the classroom is a sacred yeah. space yeah. That, for that to happen. And I love, yeah, that's why... We yeah, do what we do. Yeah. But the 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 idea that you're actually having them for the first time, like this is the kind of thing you're gonna have to walk into, and you're yeah. gonna walk into an apartment, yeah, into a building that's yeah. gonna be filled with those pe like people mm -hmm. that are going through those kinds of things that can't express that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like the the having that sort of a lot of our instructors in the NRC do that kind of workplace yeah. modeling. Yeah. Where it's like you have to live and in person experience something similar to yeah. what you're going to do. Yeah. Um, After that exercise, uh, most of the students will come back and say, you know what, well, you're just like me. And I, I would have never known.
just from, and this happens maybe two, three weeks in to the program. So mm-hmm. up until that point, they see me as an instructor, and then now they, they shift into, oh, I relate now. I can see where you're coming from. Is there anything like, if you talked about workshops, and I imagine that there's something of the workshops that are kind of what Joel is talking about. Like, can you give me an example of a workshop where there, a student is having that same sort of aha moment, you know, where they're, they're sort of experiencing something, again, the liveness of the work that we do, sort of at the sort of NRC service work training kind of stuff. Like, give me an example of that kind of workshop. Um, well, one of the ones that we conduct, and Joel yeah. kind of and I kind of do it together, oh, cool. um, is a mock interview. Ah, uh, yeah. And during that, students discover where they are really weak, and those are the aha moments for all of us. Do you have an example? Um, what's a good example? Um, I think Doris Jones might be a good example. I don't know if you remember that one, Joel. Yes. yes, yes. Um, <laughs> so you know she had a lot of confidence you know she she's been working mm-hmm. um you know but i think a lot of her interviews in her past were were not as intense as what we made it to be mm-hmm. because she, if she wants to be a community health worker she has to answer some tough questions sure. so when we had that opportunity to ask her those tough questions she froze and she had to humble herself to to be prepared for what's really out there. And we had to explain to her, I said, you know, you froze because you were nervous. And you 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 now have to realize and recognize that you might be skilled and you might be talented, but that doesn't mean you can sell yourself in this interview. So those type of aha moments um, raises flags for the whole class and for all of our students. Mm-hmm. And those are, you know, things that we try to tackle. All those areas and from an employment perspective where in our head, we're confident we can do this, but when the action, when that camera starts to roll, <laughs> you know, you can instantly just become a, a, a frozen vessel and you can't respond or react to yeah. what's happening. And this is really kind of for both of you, like the, what is it about the community health worker position as a job or the training that, it, I mean, the job titles might be various, yeah. more various yeah. than CHW, but like the, the training that you're doing that lends itself to this kind of, like what type of person is this that does this job? And like in like thinking about, <laughs> you know, this is a it's a person that's self aware. Um, we've had a number of students that really don't are not aware um, of who they are, um, and, and to just you know challenge their own biases and to try to understand people from other cultures mm-hmm. when they've been so just pigeonholed into this is my community and you know and Hartford is this kind of quasi segregated still even mm. from when I was growing up sure. um, so you you have folks in that class that are from different age ranges and not a ton of diversity but enough diversity enough for them to see other people in other that people class. from the suburbs in that class I mean are you getting there, you, we've had uh, maybe like three or four in each like one one now in, in this cycle most of the students are from Hartford right mm-hmm. and New Britain last cycle we had um who did we have? We had a no. I don't know if we had anyone from the suburbs. We had a couple of middle class uh, folks yeah. in there. Um, we had a male. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Shalasi. Yeah. He, he's a uh, blue collar. Yes, middle worker. Class, right. He okay. wants to, you know. But you know, Randall and I have done a couple because I'm in my daytime job. I do job development for the state of Connecticut. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've done resume writing together, um, and we offer two workshops of that each cycle. Mm-hmm. Um, and in this last cycle, you know, you had asked Randall, "What? Do, how do you? How do you help them?" And you know, we do a great job at teaching them to teach themselves. So it's not just enough to for us to do your resume. Um, we're going to teach you what a combination is, what a functional resume looks like, what a chronological resume looks like, how not to use templates, how to use keywords, and you're going to do your resume. <laughs> yeah. How bad are students, I mean, this is something I was just having a conversation with earlier, how bad are students at realizing that they actually have more experience than they think? Oh, and I can definitely speak to that. Um, <laughs> You know, they don't, they don't, some students don't recognize that they're not really selling themselves on these resumes. Okay, you worked at Stop and Shop. You are not just a, a cashier. Mm-hmm. You also interacted with the public. You sure. also um, ha- uh, worked in team settings. You, I mean, helping them build these resumes up, even the volunteer exper- experiences that they've had, mm-hmm. they don't include 
the whole spectrum of what they're capable of. So uh, mm -hmm. I can get a resume that's only half of a page and a student will really think that's a complete resume. And, you know, I have to sit with them, some of them one on one and counsel them and pull out information going back a couple of years or so mm -hmm. just to really get them to elaborate more on, you know, all the things that they've experienced. And they say, wow, I didn't know I could put that on there. So mm -hmm. it's like, wow, it's, it's almost um, a moment of enlightenment for a lot of them. Like, wow, I didn't know. I, I just didn't know. <laughs> so <laughs> like, is there are there. Is there anything in sort of the classroom setting that kind of st that does that same sort of work where you're you're maybe not even necessarily like tapping into what they've already done necessarily, but sort of uh, having uh, giving them the ability to name skills that they didn't know but that they need to be able to describe that they have. Well, we have some students who have experience in the field, but no uh, degree or certification or anything mm -hmm. behind it. And there was a student in this cycle who said, I've been doing this for a while now. Why do I have to take this class? I know what I'm doing. Like, why do I even have to get a degree? Why can't I just work in the community? I've been doing this. I sit on a number of boards. That's mm -hmm. Carolyn Austin. <laughs> mm -hmm. And last week she said, oh, that's what that's called. That's that's what um, conflict resolution is. That's what person-centered planning is. Mm -hmm. That's what that's called. That's what motivational interviewing is. Mm -hmm. um, and she didn't realize that she was doing part pieces of that. And now you have the theory, you have the technique, Technique and now we're practicing it in class, so she's able to call it something. So, how do you practice in class? Like, is, is your class is it scenario based? Is it role play? What kinds of what? Oh, I type? remember what it was to be a student. So, <laughs> I like to keep the class fun. Mm -hmm. um, and also, so I do uh, some lecture. I do mm -hmm. PowerPoint lecturing, and then I also bring in some YouTube examples for them to see mm -hmm. the same thing that we cover in class. Mm -hmm. And then we do role play. Um, last week we were doing um, we were doing a bunch of intakes. So we were going mm -hmm. over um, the initial intake, the beginning, the middle, and the end of that. Mm -hmm. How to kind of bring in all the other concepts. How to be culturally aware. How to ask open-ended questions. So it all kind of just came together, and now we're here practicing this intake. Are you? Are you? I know a lot of a lot of our NRC folks throw in obstacles, or they'll coach, especially on the EMT side. They'll mm -hmm. coach, or either kind of live if it's sort of being kind of produced mm -hmm. for everybody that they'll th kind of shout out obstacles like or coach somebody to be a jerk mm -hmm. you know are, are you doing that kind of that same kind of thing what kinds of things are like that, that you know? well I know that in past um, classes I'll give them um, particular cases and so they have to act within that particular profile oh, okay um, this time around I said to them you know they have their own stories um, and so <laughs> A lot of them also need services for themselves. So I said to them, why don't you, so one is the CHW, the other one is the client. Mm -hmm. So the person who's the client, you can either use your story or act like someone and use a chronic health condition, whether it be diabetes, hypertension, mm -hmm. and then act as that particular student. And then if you want to be difficult, you can. If you don't, just, so kind of a free. Have, have, they, have they come back to you in terms of the, reflecting on the being the patient? sort of position like or being the client that like I can't imagine that not being the most in the same way that you were a student mm -hmm. we were we were mm -hmm. all students at some mm -hmm. point we now know and that knowledge is being transferred into how we do how we work with students well after each um, we process um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a clinician so right. I process everything at the mm -hmm. end of everything that we do um, so it was, are they writing and doing or is it written in a world or just sort of shared sort of they're open? sharing so it's mm -hmm. what's the feedback from the client to the clinician and it mm -hmm. has to be honest feedback mm -hmm. so how did that person do how did she make you feel he make you feel and mm -hmm. then for the um, community health worker what are so how did you feel in this process asking these questions mm -hmm. um, most of the students in my class or all of the students in my class have one time or another have been the client Mm -hmm. um, and whether it be a case manager, a therapist, or de department social services, they've been the client, so they know how it feels to be asked these questions. So mm -hmm. we're processing in the moment. Um, I was a little uh, disappointed in them this last time because you had certain groups that really took this really seriously. Mm -hmm. And I go around and I'm coaching them in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a couple of younger students who were just kind of laughing things off. And so I let them go through that experience. And then at the end of it, I said, you know, I like to laugh too and I like to have a good time, but I also like to learn. Um, and, you know, this work is serious. You're dealing with people. You're dealing with people's lives. 
Um, so I, I, at times I need you to be serious about this work because you can't make this something that's always going to be funny. You're going to hear so many difficult stories um, that you have to be present mm-hmm. in that moment. On the job developer side, the you know I know sometimes it can be apathy. You know it can be you know a, a formality like or uh, you know do you know the sort of like the, the sort of the other spectrum which is you know save me save me. How are you coaching students through that sort of those sort of extreme those extremes? You know when they come in and they kind of have, kind of for lack of a better term, the wrong attitude. Um. Well, what I've done is, um, I, I by by the nature of my job, I also have to mentor sure. our students. So when students have a a, a bad attitude or a, a bad outlook on you know, what it is they're trying to accomplish and achieve, mm-hmm. we have to really be honest. We have open, honest conversations, and we have to come up with a solid plan to get you on track. For example, a student, she took our um, non-credit certificate program, CHW class here. Mm-hmm. Um, she wants instant gratification. And with that instant gratification, uh, she brings a lot of, you know, baggage with it in terms of, the way she's handling this. She's trying to do too much at once Mm -hmm. and she's working, she's trying to go to school full time and she's coming here. And she can't understand why she can't just break into the field. So she and I had to, you know, reflect on her outlook and her attitude towards the way she's approaching this. Mm -hmm. So I gave her some examples of how she might come off to certain people and how she presents herself. And I said, you know, that, you know, those types of behaviors are only hindering you in your in your uh, pursuit for what you want, mm-hmm. you know, because a lot of people are not going to want to help you when you are, you know, you're a little negative. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's no positivity in everything that you're trying to do. Um, and everything has a bad result per your, you, you know, your description of things. So we need to work together, really reflect on what it is that you need to focus on and get rid of all the negativity. So that mentorship really helps a lot of our students. And I and I have to um, with the populations that we work with, I do that quite often. You know, um, I develop that rapport with our students to want to come to me for, you know, you can come to me for your social issues that might hinder you from getting this job I'm I'm trying to help you get. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you need another job so that you can pay for X, Y, and Z. Okay, well, let's try to get you another job in this area or increase your hours at your current job. Mm -hmm. So the mentorship um, goes far beyond my job development at times because I have to get this person um, mentally prepared Mm -hmm. to even go to a job or a next job. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a a, um, two-in-one type of job that I have to do with the mentorship and the job development piece. The the idea of accountability is that something that, like, you know, it can be such a it can be a, a difficult thing to manage where you're building personal relationships. Again, when we teach in community, we work in community colleges. Mm-hmm. It's it's so about it's about personal relationships. Yeah. That you know, how do you you know you're talking about mentorship and the again the word that came to mind was accountability. Like. Do you find that you're able to build a kind of rapport where they are kind of accountable to you? And are you able to kind of push them away and say, okay, now you're going to be accountable to yourself? And like, like, you like, you know what I mean? Like, is it like, I, mean, I seem to be coming back to that sort of idea of like, <coughs> when, when do you carry them and when do they carry themselves? Mm-hmm. That kind of thing. It's case by case for me. Um, I, I can't lie. I think I, I hold on a little too long, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I've yet to find. Well, you did a great. You did a great last cycle, and I'm not going to mention this person's name. Mm-hmm. But last cycle, we were doing mock interviews together, um, and so this person very poor insight into who they are. They've you know been disruptive. We've identified this person. We had conversations with this person. Mm-hmm. Um, and so now it's Randall's turn to experience it. <laughs> He's in the class <laughs> doing mock interviewing. And this person just really was very dismissive in the interview, um, was not excited at all, was not into the interview, just really all the wrong things. And I had never seen you for the first time, Randall said. 
okay, you're, you're not going to get a job like that. This person really thinks or thought that this is the way that they should be interviewing and present themselves. So it was an aha moment for that person, but mm-hmm. the insight wasn't fully there for them. Um, and so we said no. And, and that's when Randall said, you know what, I don't, I'm not going to be able to place you. I, not with that attitude, not with that behavior. We will not be able to pr- pr- uh, place you into an internship Um with you displaying that it's not a good name for you it's not a good name for the college for the program um and so um this person ended up doing things on their own and i think they're better off now they're still connected they still come to see you they do um (laughs) so he was successful he completed the program but and and i don't know how fully aware he is today of his behavior um you meet with him yeah um but i think he may be a little bit better off than when he started um Mm -hmm. with us right do students talk to you about um, their high school experience, their experience, or their any sort of educational experience before coming to see you guys on both kind of both sides? Like the, in terms of like, man, why wasn't, wh- why didn't, you know, again, somebody who does the, 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 the idea of self-awareness suddenly now in their 20s, 30s, even 40s, 50s, whatever, that like for the first time you guys are the first people to have this conversation with me do they does does anyone kind of talk to you about that kind of like where was this when i was 12 kind of thing at all i mean i haven't had any of those experiences myself but Mm -hmm. i will say that um you know i i I try to remember myself and when i was that person on the other side Mm -hmm. um and that's what that's kind of the angle that i come with um to the class so for them, um, writing and then me giving them feedback. They're doing journals for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't think that some of them have ever gotten the feedback that I write to them on mm-hmm. their um, journals. And so they'll smile at me and I say, yeah, you can do this. This is, you know, I don't think they've had those messages before. So mm-hmm. that is something that I see. But I haven't heard them say, wow, was it? Except for the other person who said, you know, I've been doing this forever. Now I see why I need the certificate. Now I see why I need to go on mm-hmm. right, to further education. And that's something that I kind of discuss the process Mm -hmm. of being successful you know as he's told his story I tell mine Mm -hmm. as well Um, telling them you know straight out of college I didn't just get a job you know Mm -hmm. so you have to break down the the diligence that you must have to really be successful so continuously you know promoting more education and just you know having a determination within you to really want to get out there and be employed is um, a part of the process I really dis- discuss with them. And, you know, we do some reflection on, you know, high school or maybe how I went from high school to where I, cause I explain it. I didn't I didn't just go to college. I, I was in community college as well. I had to transfer. I had to keep going. Uh, this is not the end. So gr- granted, I you know, the programs are great, but students, um, I explain the more you learn, the more you earn. So, mm-hmm. you know, this is a process. So we reflect that way. Do you feel like um, students are, um, again, because of the very intimate experiences and the sort of personal experiences, mm-hmm. that they're really kind of attaching themselves to a place like this? That it's really, again, you have people coming back to you again mm-hmm. and again um, that uh, just kind of talk, kind of talk or reflect on that sort of that's kind of bond that that I think places like this and especially these kinds of trainings can offer for people. Again, coming from again kinds of backgrounds where you know either their family life or their social life, like mm-hmm. it's telling them no, telling them you're worthless. T- like that's sort of like what places mm-hmm. like this do for. People again. Ironically, we're talking about a program yeah. in CHW that trains people to help people out yeah. of those situations. Anyway, well, see, I, 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 like I said, I have a full time job, mm-hmm. but um, I had a student call me, <laughs> found my number at the full time job, yeah, um, from an internship. They were having a breakdown, um, and so she said, "I know that I'm not supposed to call you here, but I didn't know who else to call, and so I spent ten minutes with her on the phone." And then she was good. And she actually talked about that at the last graduation of how she was in crisis mode and how that helped her out. Mm -hmm. I had another student who called me after hours um, from two cohorts ago. And so I said to that person, she was also just either was let go from the job. And Mm -hmm. I said, I need you guys to connect with Randall because you placed her Mm -hmm. connect with. And so I gave her some advice as to what to do, what next, next, next steps to take, especially when it came to medical. She lost her medical. She was just 
back to where she started at Mm -hmm. when she started with the program. And the program did a lot for her, got her a job. I mean, she really was doing well off, and now she's back to the same place. Mm -hmm. Um, So I connect with them. I I live in Hartford. I work in Hartford. Mm -hmm. I shop in Hartford. I buy in Hartford. Mm -hmm. So I see my students everywhere. I have a student that works at BJ's. I walk into, oh, hey, Joelle. And I was like, hey, how are you? And so um, I see them all the time. Yeah. Um, that yeah, is this kind of the same? I mean, how much? I mean, are you do? It sounds like you do have a lot of you know there. There is a, an intimacy to what you're describing as well with sort of job developing again. Job. I mean, I want to ask you some more questions about sort of what the job market, but like that finding a job, especially now, especially here, especially in communities like Hartford. It's such an emotional task. It's always an emotional task, no matter where, but especially in places like this. Like how? I mean, the the how have you found that? You know, it sounds like so much of your job, Randall, is counseling. Yes, <laughs> and um, it can be overwhelming at times because, not to be negative, but sometimes finding a job is really difficult in the city. Um, you know, and you know, we all want it. it it hurts me when I go home and I, I haven't placed anyone in a job sometimes. And I know these people are deserving of an opportunity. Mm-hmm. They're skilled. They have what it takes to be successful. They're ready. And especially when they're done with the class, um, you know, as they come out of these internships, if a student is not, you know, placed within a position where they're getting paid and earning a living and they just want to, you know, live a normal average middle class life um, is difficult when I can't find that opportunity for them right away. Mm -hmm. And then the other part, the breakdown occurs is where they start to lose confidence in themselves. And this is where my recapturing of them becomes even more difficult because they're broken down in a way that it's hard for me to get that momentum back or that Mm -hmm. motivation back. So I have to create opportunities that are just a little bit more, um, I would say just less challenging for them. Something that I can coach them and mentor them through or create opportunities directly as opposed to them trying to navigate through this tough environment to try to find those opportunities. So Mm -hmm. the burden, is not a burden per se, but the challenge for me is finding employers who are willing to open their doors to meet directly with our students um, and give them a direct opportunity to interview and or um, be placed in um, one of their positions at their facility or business. Mm. Let's talk about the kinds of positions. Again, community health worker, it's not like that's not what the job title is going to be. So let's talk kind of about the industry a little bit. Kind of give us a primer on, on, on what you know, someone getting a CHW, getting that piece of paper that says community health worker, what that, where, where those doors are that you're looking, you know, what are you talking, you know, where, where, how are you coaching students in terms of, you know, this is the kind of job description you're looking for. This is for looking for this, looking for that. Well, what I do is, um, especially in the last few months is, uh, when I'm researching the job market, I'm noticing that the trend is associate's degree, bachelor's degree for titles specifically connected to community health worker. Mm -hmm. However, what students need to look for, they they really need to look for those jobs that have high school diploma attached to it, but are looking for specific skills that relate to the community health worker. Because it's hard to get into jobs where um, they require associate's degree or a bachelor's degree, et cetera. And the other barrier that I experience um, for our students is the bilingual aspect. Not a whole lot of our community health workers here are bilingual. Really? So, right. I think it would have been for, the exact opposite. For our community health worker class, no, not so much. And um, huh. But I think as the class becomes more popular, more of our South End residents mm-hmm. might, uh, you know, transition in, into this type of work Mm -hmm. um but for the most part it's uh north harford windsor um bloomfield areas that Mm -hmm. um usually have been taking these classes so that becomes another challenge because i'll get employers who say 
do you have a community health worker for me for this position, but they must be bilingual. And then I'm looking through the whole list and I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't have anybody. Yeah, about, I've done this class now, it's my fourth cycle. Mm-hmm. And about I can count about five Latino students. Really? And that in all those cycles. Huh. So yeah, <clears throat> you know, I teach my students to look for intake specialists, to look for outreach, community organizer, advocate. There's all kinds of jobs um, mm-hmm. that they can do. Um, I also ingrain in them that this piece of paper, it's wonderful, it's beautiful. You're learning a lot of what somebody in a master level program is going to learn mm-hmm. over semesters, especially you know when they're le- learning about motivational interviewing and person-centered. That's part of a counseling degree, sure. um, and ma- folks in master levels are doing that. So they're mm-hmm. getting a good quality education here. Um, but that they need to go forward. They need to go and get that associate's degree. Um, you know, I push them. They have to go forward. They have to go get that piece of paper. Um, mm-hmm. It's not to say that they can't get a job because some of our right. folks have gotten pretty great jobs without a degree. Right. Um, we have someone who's working at St. Francis that you placed. Yes, we do. Um, she started off working at the... Uh, North Central Agency on Aging. And, but sh- this one here, she's just very, she's just an exceptional student. Where uh-huh. She was just a go-getter. She was a networker. Um, mm-hmm. She was just, she just had it in her. She came from the insurance industry. Mm-hmm. And her own health issues, her own, we have a lot of those students who have their own health issues, have not been able to get adequate access to health care. And so they have their that story. Mm-hmm. And so she's one of those students. And she was just, real, she's just into everything, every conference that there is there she's going to them she's she's she is that star student um mm-hmm. and 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 um she's been at conferences uh, mm-hmm. with you guys and yeah. she has spoken great about the college and she's now at st francis um hospital mm-hmm. and Spring another thing i'd like to add is um what i've noticed a lot of the students i've been able to place were they were getting jobs based on grant funds that certain organizations had mm-hmm. so that's what I've noticed. A lot of the grants that are coming through to certain uh, organizations, hospitals, et cetera, that's where we're seeing success as well. Because now um, it seems that the employer can now, they can determine who they want to hire for these particular community health worker jobs as opposed to um, jobs that are related to it but already have a foundation of what they want for this particular position or mm-hmm. what certain uh, funders want for this particular position. For example, um, we had our speaker come in um, from Catholic Charities and, you know, the students inquired, you know, they really want to get into the work that they do there, Mm -hmm. but their funders require that these types of positions have associate's degrees attached to them. So those are the types of barriers we find um, as we try to research and navigate through um, the employment sector to try to get our community health workers hired. You know, Randall mentioned the speaker, and I think that's huge um, because we do invite speakers. And and what I like Mm -hmm. about this particular speaker is that he also is from Hartford, Mm -hmm. um, politician, director of this community center. Uh, You know, he ran for mayor and he's, you know, he's one of us. And so he was able to explain his story. And we talked about strength-based counseling counseling, and how, you know, traditional case management or counseling had to do with, you know, you provide all the services and then you do everything for your client and then they are not learning what to do for themselves. Right. So he talked about that concept. He talked about motivational interviewing. And this is something that his particular center um, has to do. They're those case managers do and that's what they practice. So they're hearing this and they're saying, wow, like I'm, I'm really learning what's happening out in the world today and the world of work and this particular area um you know we have a case manager that's coming in who doesn't have a degree but she has a ton of years of experience she's a supportive housing case manager for chrysalis mm-hmm. um and she's going into people's homes she's working with the homeless population who has substance abuse who also may have uh, mental health or co-occurring disorders and so she's going to talk about her experience and so each person that comes in i, I always say do a bio it's not about showing off and talking about putting yourself in a position where you're on a pedestal, but it's about mm. telling them who you are and where you come from so they can see that these opportunities are also available for you. Is there on-site opportunities within CHW to like go to go somewhere, or is it or is it mostly or all basically people coming in from sort of the community that do that do the kind of work that the, the students are training to do? Is there sort of like a, a like 
uh, I guess maybe this is just from having a conversation with someone who does take people mm-hmm. out to job sites. That like, is there is there any of that built built in? It, the only thing we really do is really we try to create those internships mm-hmm. for folks um, okay. to get more experience. Like kind of unpaid job right. shadowing. And part of the message I give to the students when they're going into these unpaid, because uh, Jillian turned it into a paid opportunity. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, you're going into these places, and these are all unpaid 35 hours, which is required of the program. But, you know, show them who you are. Show them everything that you've learned. Do something exceptional. Do something different, because that could potentially turn into um, a paid job. You just, you never know. Mm. Um, but we haven't done anything on site. This cycle, for the first time, actually, tonight, we're having a reunion. Mm-hmm. Oh, cool. um, and that's brand new. Right. Um, so we're inviting all the other cohorts to come in with the current cycle that's happening today. Oh, that's great. We have, that's, so, yeah. we, we have someone from Capital that's going to talk about the Human Services Program. I've been preaching to my students this cycle. You need to go and get that degree, get that degree. Um, you know, I'm sure other students who right. are not working or working may come in and share their stories. So there's a number of people coming in. Um, this cycle, we also connected with the Hartford uh, Board of Education. Right. Um, oh. With a school nurse. Um, oh, wow. And so I think she's doing a day or did a day with, with us. Um, and she's talking about uh, in the life of a school nurse because yeah. I think schools are looking to potentially bring on CHWs to work with parents. Um, so, so there's a that lot may of be that may be the one voice uh, again because that's the one place you're going to send your kid. That may be the person that is introducing you to other mm-hmm. things. That yeah, absolutely. And the theme of um, continuing on with education. What I like what Capital has done here is they've allowed students to take at least six credits from this community health workers class to okay. pursue a social a social services degree here at cool. the school. So it's a great incentive to want to continue on more knowing mm-hmm. that you can build on your education with the uh, certificate program that you have here. Uh, and sort of, again, sort of another market industry question. Uh, what have you, both of you in your sort of experience, seen over the period of time that you've kind of been working in this quote field or whatever? What's, cha- what's changing? What's different? Like what's coming? What do you see in terms of this role uh, you know, that's happening right now? that you're delivering Uh, to your students? Well, what I've noticed is um, because part of my job is I'm a salesman to some degree. You know, when I'm a job developer and, and, you know, (laughs) I go out and say community, (laughs) you know, when I'm going to these various organizations, they've never heard of a community health worker. So I'm consistently, you know, educating uh, our employment sectors about what a community health worker is. But now I'm seeing the term becoming more frequently used as employers speak to us about it, you know, um, as it becomes more popular um, among hospitals, et cetera. So I do see a positive outlook from that perspective that it's finally catching a little bit of traction. Are hospitals uh, hiring CHWs as CHWs or what kind of positions are hospitals the, looking the for? The positions that I've had students hire, they they are under the title of CHW, okay. Community Health Worker. So, And those are the ones that I'm talking about that are grant funded. Uh, mm-hmm. a, a hospital will contact me say, hey, we received this grant. Uh, community Health Worker is attached to it. Um, do you have any? And that's pretty much how the, um, you know, the dialogue continues from there. And, you know, I wish more organizations could pick that up mm. or, you know, start that trend. Mm-hmm. You know, I, as I've been doing this work and kind of looking at what's, you know, being offered, at, you know, in the community, because I'm also, I do job development for my day job, um, you know, that, that degree is huge. Um, so having that piece of paper is something that, so you used to be able to work in this field and have tons of work experience and volunteer experience and be from that community, but mm-hmm. now it's really changing. You have more folks that are looking for work who have the bachelor's degrees, who have the master's degrees, and so they're taking on a lot of those entry-level jobs. Um, mm-hmm. So having that degree backing you up is huge. Um, you know, the, the other thing that you know, I think that I see in terms of what's needed for this particular program is something more around medical aspects. So looking at the disability and the lifespan of disability as it impacts people, depending on where they become I- I impacted, whether it be at you know at the early stages or in middle to late adulthood, mm-hmm. um, and learning the different aspects of that particular disability and the medical aspects behind it, mm-hmm. <clears throat> so they're able to really work and understand that because that's something that you know we do in our program, but there's not enough time to do that. Um, is this is the medical model of disability still kind of the norm? In the uh, 
uh, you know, I don't ascribe to the medical model, but uh, <laughs> not at all. I think that's changing. I think There's, that's changing. You know, I talk about my own experiences. I see a doctor who doesn't believe in, in, in just pumping me with medication, you know, and I've done this medical detox with her. I've done this. And so now I've gotten rid of my diabetes. Um, not the diabetes, right. but I've gotten rid of the pill. So right. we're still monitoring it. So I talk to the students about that and mm-hmm. kind of what she's helping me go through. Where my other doctor would have just said, here, take this, take this, take that. And she doesn't want to do that. So I think it is changing. I think it's changing a lot. And then incorporating health and exercise into that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we talked about that and, and what's here in Hartford. Um, where you can get good food at, some fresh, good quality food. And, you know, we don't see that very well. But we do have some places like the Billings Fortage Foundation. They're mm-hmm. farm to table and they do a lot of their own organic stuff. And really? so there's some stuff that's slowly changing, but it's going to be very grassroots. Um, and it's going to take the community to make those changes. Is there a lot of progressives? I mean, you t- I mean, you mentioned Catholic Charities, which has, a, you know, it's, it's sort of mode of this mm-hmm. way of being. You're talking about sort of farm to table, sort of more progressive stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, is there, I mean, is this a political job? Is there a lot of, you know, if it's, is there a, I mean, how much, how much, conver- how much conversation do you have <clears> with <throat> students about sort of, again, I mean, you kind of have to in terms of cultural biases mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Like you may be walking into a home where someone's lifestyle may, you may, may have been told your whole life that this is wrong, but you, you still have to help that person. The person's still diabetic. Mm-hmm. The person still has mm-hmm. a, you know, a, a, you know, a single parent house or whatever, like, they, like they, they need help. Well, we talk about, you know, um, how politics play into the healthcare system. Right. Um, we talk about structural racism, um, environmental racism, and how things are purposeful. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, why it is that we live near a dump here in Hartford. Um, why is it that there are so many um, liquor stores in your community? Why are there so many um, fast food places versus having the Whole Foods stores versus having some of those organic farm places? Mm-hmm. So... <clears throat> we talk about how pur- purposeful that is, and so it, it gets them angry. Um, it gets them feeling all kinds of things. So we talk about the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, mm-hmm. and we talk about the sterilization of uh, Puerto Rican women. Mm-hmm. Um, and so those Heal things, cells, all that, yeah. they, they're just like, wow. And so who <laughs> runs the hospitals at the end of the day? Politicians and government runs the hospitals. So these are things that I think they've had conversations in their homes about, but now to to see it, to hear it, to see the videos, and to talk in an about academic it. environment. Yeah, I mean, like the like, is there again on the job development side? Like again, talking to you know, it's like you you know, how much how much do you have a conversation with them in terms of like your politics versus mm-hmm. the politics of your employer? Do you do you talk to them about like okay, are, do you want this job or do you want to hold on to whatever that that thing is that's you know mm-hmm. that you have that's stopping you from you know from wanting to take this job i had a challenge with a couple of students um a couple of cohorts ago um planned parenthood was looking to hire mm-hmm. but due to personal beliefs and uh, things of that nature uh folks were uncomfortable with that type of you know job and they didn't have jobs and i was like wow it's there's nothing i can say to that i i, I mean i can try to motivate you as much as I can but if it's in your heart that you don't want to do something like that then mm-hmm. that that leaves me in a, a place where I'm just neutral well I, I can only offer you what's here if, if you choose to take it then you know you know hopefully you, you can see past it but if you can't I totally understand it's just an issue. I mean, it's the the resiliency because it's been like three years of a conversation. I only joined at the sign of final year, mm-hmm. but like that's part of resiliency as well. Like we're finding a lot of like I'm finding personally as somebody who's about the nexus of all these storytelling conversations and stuff that you know humor and imagination and things like that where it's like that's also part of resiliency that. You know, in a way, is is so much the currency of, mm-hmm. of community colleges, where it's like, you bring, you know, I was I always joke about it's like if, if you're, you know, if if you're a super prejudiced race, uh, racist kind of person, what are you doing in a community yeah, college? It's, it's like being a racist in New York. It's like what's the point? <laughs> <laughs> like fool, right? Yeah. So <laughs> it's like the the that like so much of what the you know, and I, I talk to instructors about like, okay, are are you evaluating this? Are you talking about this? Like, what are you do, what are you doing? Like in that in the, again, it's why I, I kind of brought that question out. Like we talk about various populations and understanding which population you really want to work with. Mm-hmm. Um, understand 
understanding the policies of the agency. Um, we talked about sex offenders. I talk about that. Um, mm-hmm. You know, how I've had to work with folks who are pedophiles and now they're out of the system. They're rehabilitated. Mm-hmm. They're um, seeing a therapist. Yeah. <clears throat> but you have to represent them. Which, you have and, to look out for them. And yeah. as counselors and as community health workers, we believe that one of the tenets is that people can change. Because if you don't believe that people can change, you're not in the field. You're not in the right fields for yourself at all. Mm-hmm. You're going to get burnt out and you're going to... You, you, people can change. And mm-hmm. so you have to take it from that perspective. Now, in some places, you may be able to say, you know what, I feel uncomfortable working with this person. Is there a way for this person to get assigned to mm-hmm. someone else? But when you're in a nonprofit agency, they're strapped for dollars, they're very stretched thin, and you know, you're doing 15 million things you may not have that luxury at being able to say, I can't work with this particular case. Mm -hmm. So that's where that that supervision comes into place. That's where you are going to have to challenge yourself because you're going to have to work with all types of people. It doesn't matter if you decide I want to work with, you know, folks with substance abuse. You may have a pedophile who is a substance abuser. So you have to be able to expose yourself to a number of different things. And is is a classroom or, again, sort of your office, Randall, is that, I mean, is there, is there... Can you prepare a student for that? Or is that just, you got to jump into that pool and see if you swim? Like for you guys, again, as, as educators. I think we're going to do so much. Yeah. You're going to have to jump yourself, jump into that. And, mm-hmm. you know, there are some case studies in the book. Um, and there was one about Simone, who was a transgendered um, person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she was kicked out of her house. And, you know, she was shunned by the family, had a degree. And now she's turned to substances really angry. And so, you know, the students were really excited about that. And they were just like, wow, transgendered. And they just, some of them laughed a little bit on the side. And, you know, I said, you know, I have this documentary. It's called Paris is Burning. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen it? I've seen it. And I said, you know, this is not part of the curriculum. But it gives you an inside look as to inner city um, gay subculture. And Mm -hmm. this is where you hear all the language you hear on Bravo and all that's where this came from. It came from this particular, from my community, from the community I relate to. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you guys want to watch this? And so I've been doing that every cycle. I I watch, we watch that movie and we talk about it. Some of them laugh and they are able to see, you know, the gay community, transgendered folks. And so, and I can only kind of answer as much as I can to, to, in my experience with them. So I expose them to that. I also do another thing on Latino culture um, that's not in the curriculum. I, I do training for the state on how to work with Latino populations because that's who they're going to be working with mm-hmm. um, when they get out there for the most part. And so, you know, it's levels of acculturation and assimilation, but this is what the, my experience is. And so I try to do as much as I can, but, you know, we can't control for it all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Culturally speaking, I, I, there's not a lot that I can do around that. The only types of culture I can de- prepare them for is on the job culture. Mm. Um, so is that new? Is I mean, is that is it kind of a culture in and of itself? It's like right. whatever. There's a bunch of people bringing all their stuff with them, but ultimately there's production. There is right. <laughs> you know, right. So you know, dressing for success, or you know. S- uh, speaking um, professionally, mm-hmm. um, you know, just making sure your behaviors, that you're aware of certain behaviors that you probably mm-hmm. exemplify in front of all of us. Is that something you're evaluating for, Joel, in terms of well, in class? Or a, day one, we do a whole uh, college classroom etiquette because <laughs> some of them have not been exposed to all right. at all. And so how do you behave in this culture, in this classroom? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, it's okay to get, you don't have to raise your hand in the college to go to the bathroom. You can go, just come back you know things around cell phone things around talking to each other eating food and so we do that from day one um, I use all of my experiences you know I worked in the Bronx I worked in Brooklyn I all well for the work so I come from this field um, you know and I've been with the state now helping people with disabilities so this is this is my background and so when I say to them yeah you're gonna have to meet deadlines you're gonna have to do you know at my job we have 60 days to make a determination on eligibility we have to have 600 or 100 intakes a year we have to have 32 successful outcomes so you're going to have to produce this is this is what it is um mm. so the, it starts here you know if you're not coming to class on time that's not a good that's not we, we're going to have a conversation mm. about that mm-hmm. um so we try to model as much as we can yeah and then that's the accountability then, stuff you're yeah, talking about yeah. like with where it's like yeah i expect you to come into this mm-hmm. mock interview looking like you know like this is what's going to be expected mm-hmm. out there right 
yeah. to close up, because we've been chatting for almost an hour. <laughs> uh, can you guys think of uh, for each of the sort of for each of you um, looking ahead? What's something, sort of an idea, a spark that you have that you haven't necessarily done yet, but you're like, at some point I'm going to try this with the students and see if it works. Is there some, is there some sort of germ or even, you know, be as broad as you feel, you know, like maybe it hasn't like quite crystallized yet, but is there something that you're thinking of doing, you know, in the next year or so that like with your students are like, I've never tried that. I'm going to try something else. What's that? What's the, what's the thing that kind of sparks the latest spark for you? Um, exposure for me. Um, I really want to get more employers Involved. Granted, we have a uh, an advisory council. Mm-hmm. I want to get more organizations on board to really get an opportunity to evaluate what community health worker is really all about. Mm-hmm. Um, not just for the purposes of me being a job developer, trying to bring more employers in and just buying in, but I really want them to understand you know, the importance of uh, a community health worker within their organization and place within their communities um, that they're trying to serve. So that's the spark for me is just getting more employers involved. How do you think you do? How, how is that? Is that like going to me? It's just hitting the streets. You got to hit the streets. <laughs> All right. Cold calls, emails. Those are good. But the most the, the, the way I've been most successful Mm-hmm. Um, with all of our uh, classes that we run here is when I've gotten out to the community on my own. Emails and phone calls, you know, they work to a degree, but yeah. when you really get out there, sit with the employer, have them really understand what it is you're trying to do, what your objectives are. So it's there you go. Yeah, <laughs> you, you have to get out there. That's where I've, sure, I've received most of my success is when I've been able to really get out into the community and sit with the employers and kind of see what they do too so I can see what aligns with what yeah, we do here. Yeah, we were, we were talking about Faith Callert. You know, that's, that's, that was always her thing was that like, yeah, I, 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 can, I can be the person on the phone but once I was able to shake someone's hand be like, I'm good for you. Right. <laughs> you know, and Faith has that kind of person. And, and, you do too. And technology has kind of taken that away, you know, that, yeah. that, that natural communication, you know, to really understand, feel what I'm telling you. Yeah, and, and we're, you're talking about other community health worker people, prof- professional people who are in this, the, the do work in this field. They're trained to be interpersonal. Like you almost like that's the only way to do it. You right. know, like uh, so. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. What, what, do, what do you, you know? I think about uh, the outcome too, because I think that they they get a lot. I think I think the program can be completely expanded into and offer a number of other courses. So I, so mm-hmm. I see. I see that as something that I w- something I would love to see is after offering more public health courses, courses on medical aspects, um, courses on more of the theories and techniques of counseling. So I think mm-hmm. I, see, I would love to see more of an expanded program. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I also think of the outcome, which is that employment piece. Mm-hmm. So maybe doing something more like around like a networking or a coffee hour um, where folks come in and they're networking, they're bringing in job leads. Um, current students and then also uh, previous students who've also have graduated mm-hmm. um, and then I also see a job fair <laughs> on-site job fair um, you know and I think that's that's because you know we can do so much in the classroom and expand the program which I think would mm-hmm. be awesome it's not a human service program it is a human service function mm-hmm. but it, I think it's public health it, it, mm-hmm. I wouldn't call it a human services associates degree it would have to be something else um, and I would love to see that for this particular program, something more educational. Yeah, and there's a lot, again, there's a lot of, you know, like, I know Housatonic, you know, folks at Housatonic, the job fair there is always a real good, Yeah. I mean, if only, and then, you know, if only just, because you're doing mock interviews, you're doing that resume stuff, but, you know, if you're in the same way that you kind of go around the classroom, go, and go, you having you evaluating them and then having them reflect on for the first time, putting their hand out to somebody yeah. who doesn't know them, yeah. who might possibly be connected to someone who might hire them. Mm-hmm. You know, like, what was that like? How terrified were you? Yeah. You know, what did you do? And how did you overcome yeah. the stuttered stand, like when you stammered or whatever like that? That's There's nothing like that kind of experience. And we right? have pieces of that sure. in the curriculum, but it's, it's not enough. Uh, and, you know, the class already meets Monday through Thursday. I mean, yeah, Monday through Thursday, which is a lot. Mm-hmm. It's not a typical college class. 
Um, but I think that certain topics can be expanded um, mm. a lot more. Sure. Uh, to be a whole semester. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like that multicultural counseling can be that. I did a whole semester of that in graduate school. Yeah. Um, so I think that can be something that can be expanded. Is there, a, I mean, you've mentioned several times, Randall, about sort of like they need to get an associate's, they need to kind of keep going. We Like this is sort of an opening to a pipeline to pathway. Mm-hmm. Like is like that that kind of, you know, here at Capital, is that, I mean, is that something that could happen? Well, they do offer the Associates in Human Services, um, and I believe that has sociology, it has some psychology courses, and that, and that professor, the coordinator for that professor is going to be here tonight oh, um, at the reunion talking about Perfect, that yeah, like, that's what I was yeah. asking. Like, yeah. is there, is, you know, the sort of, you know, the, the, the stereotype is that the, this side doesn't talk to this side, that grants or uh, credit side doesn't talk to non-credit, and then they're the train shall meet. So, like, the, that is that happening? That sounds like it yeah. is happening. And, and, and they're here all the time. Like, right. I'm here only on Mondays. So mm-hmm. they, they, they get to see it all the time. But I know that they're coming to talk to the program today, um, and I tell them that there's this associates in human services that you need to do it. So um, we oh, talk about great. that, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good.